Known as Faux Rock for his ferocious hitting style, David Fulcher spent eight years brightly in the spotlight of the NFL. We embrace them, cheer for them. They are heroes in our eyes. Yet when their time in the spotlight ends, many go on to do the most important work of their lives. They go into overtime. Welcome to Overtime, life after the spotlight with NFL All-Pro David Fulcher and his co-host, national award-winning speaker David Coleman, exclusively on the Bootleggers Music Group Radio. Hey guys, David Fulcher here again with another episode of Overtime, life after the spotlight with my co-host David Coleman. We got a special guest today. Hey Dave, how you doing my friend? Hello David Fulcher, it's good to see you again. I'm excited about today's show. Today's show, uh, we're going to flip the script a little bit. Uh, it's not about football, not a football player, but an athlete, Bronson Royal, former pitcher for the Cincinnati Reds. How you doing, my friend? I'm doing great. How about you guys? We're doing well, man. Thank you for uh, coming on. And I uh, saw Bronson uh, doing a little singing at uh, the Holy Grail downtown Cincinnati for a Real Man Wore Pink uh, campaign that we put on. And Bronson, the first thing I want to ask you, man, is, you know, a lot of people have asked me and I've seen him and especially when I was at Holy Grail, the girls say, that that dude is so handsome. Why is he not a GQ model? You've heard that before, haven't you? Well, I remember I was walking down the street in New York City. I was a rookie in the big leagues. We were playing the Mets and somebody handed their card to me because, you know, being 6'4 and 165 pounds back then, I kind of fit the mold for a tall, lanky uh, model, I guess. She handed <laughs> my card, uh, card and said, uh, you, you want to come into the studio and, and, and be a model? And I said, well, <laughs> I said, I'm a major league baseball player. I'm not so sure I can pay the bills. And she said, yeah, yeah, I think you're good where you're at. Keep going. <laughs> awesome. 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 That's a great story. Bronson, I'll tell you why I'm so excited to have you on the show. And I didn't have a chance to talk to this day before came on, uh, before we came on the air. Some professional athletes are different sports. Honestly, not the more I watch for some of them, it looks like playing, not that they're in pain physically, just having to get out there and play looks like it's almost a burden to them. Like oh, another game, gosh, I got to get out there and play. My memories of you as a player were you looked like you were having the time of your life. It's just when you came out and I was wondering, did you have a certain walkout music when you came out? I, I'm trying to remember that. But you just seem to take the mound and walk into a game and the entire stadium atmosphere would lift. Yeah, you know, I, I think, you know, for me, I, I've always been kind of a glass, glass is half full guy. You know, I've always been an optimistic guy. I've always, you know, been pretty even keel with my personality, right? So I try to bring joy to wherever I am. And and playing the game of baseball, you know, I started kind of strange in the weight room with my father as a six and seven year old kid and lifting heavy weight, you know, and a lot of times you hear stories about how that can kind of burn a kid out. But I, I always had an idea and kind of a vision of the future and where this was going to take me. And I just really loved playing the game, you know, and I loved being around the guys. And so I, I saw so many people in a locker room who were kind of grumpy and they would complain a lot about what was going on during the day. And I just wanted to do it a different way. And then if you watched me on the field, you know, I just tended to be a guy who looked like he wasn't working you know, at 100% max. I was pitching kind of smooth. It looked like I probably had an extra five mile an hour in the tank, even though I didn't. But it was just, that was just kind of naturally the way my body moved. If you watch right. me on a basketball court, even in high school, it probably looked very similar. Um, you know, just kind of the way I moved about in my space. And part of that was also the way I pitched, which was a lot backwards and throwing a lot of soft stuff. And I was trying to use my brain, you know, the best I could to try to be a good major league pitcher without having to be so physically dominant. I mean, the picture I put behind myself today to, to give you some props, you remind me of the baseball version of Steph Curry. Sometimes it looks like Steph Curry's out there just, let's go have a pickup game while he's draining 40 footers and stealing the ball and, and dishing it off. And it it kind of looks like he's could have another gear if he wanted it, but I, I get the same thing about what you just said about yourself. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and some of that was just built into the machine, you know, the way that you kind of run and field a ground ball, a bunt play or something and flip it to first base. I was also a shortstop in the high school and pretty athletic, you know, hand-eye coordinated. A lot of guys who pitch kind of grow up just pitching. But I, you know, back in my generation, you played shortstop, you were, you know, probably the best hitter on your team when you were 12 years old. And, you know, so I tried to bring some of that to the major league stage and see if you could be a little bit more well-rounded. And, you know, even if it was just running the bases, I wanted to have an idea of what I was doing. And, and a lot of that just came off in a way that seemed a little smoother than the average pitcher. 
Wow, that, that's pretty smooth, man. And, and I think you're a smooth dude. And I've been trying to get you on this show, man, for a long time. And I'm thinking, I didn't even know you were in Cincinnati. I thought maybe you was back somewhere else in hometown. But I also wanted to ask this question, and I normally ask some of my guys this question. Let's go back to the the last pitch, the, the last time you threw a ball. And what was that conversation with management, agent, that, man, it's baseball over? Can you go back to that day and tell me how, did, how, how it happened? Was it your move to walk away, or was it the team's move to let you go? You know, I was – well, it started a few years before I had to retire. Um, I was 37 years old. I had been pitching for about 19 and a half years before I missed one game uh, and got put on the disabled wow. for the first time. So I'm with the Arizona Diamondbacks. I've been pitching since I'm an 18 year old kid out of high school all the way till I'm 37 years old. I finally have surgery on my elbow and my shoulder at the same time. And it took me about two years to come back from that. And so by the time I got into that 2017 season with the Cincinnati Reds, I knew there was a chance that I might not make it out alive at the end of that year. So I, I was pitching and as the season was progressing, I was pitching fine, but my velocity was down and I was still winning ball games, but then, then pain started setting in. And once you, you know, once you're not getting guys out and you're in pain and your velocity's down, all three of those things made it very difficult to continue on. But luckily for me, Brian Price, was my pitching coach for five years prior to being yes. the manager of the team in 2017. And so he kind of gave me carte blanche. He, just, he said, Hey, you let me know when, when you don't want to pitch anymore, you know? And so I had gone out three or four times in a row and I was just in so much pain. I couldn't play catch in between starts. My elbow was swelling up heavily. Cortisone shots weren't working anymore. And so uh, he called me in his office and he just said, Hey, what do you think? And I said, hey, I think it's time for the young kids to, to, to take my spot in the rotation. And I know there's three more months of the season, but I'll be around. I'll be lifting weights. I'm going to shag fly balls in the outfield during batting practice. And I'm going to travel with the team. You know, I felt like it was I was indebted to do that. And so, you know, it was a bit of a hard pill to swallow. But because I was also 40 years old and had been hurt the years prior to that, you know, you could kind of see the handwriting on the wall. And it wasn't a, a big shock to my system. And by that time, it was I was physically and mentally, I think, ready to kind of walk away from the game. Because when you're fighting an injury like that for about three years, you know, it can it can be daunting. Yeah. No yes. question. David, yes. you went through the same thing. Dave, David tried to come back, went to Oakland, uh, made him run some sprints, pulled his quad. Yeah. And he kind of knew at that point in time, right, David, that it was time it, to call it quits. Yeah, you know, it, it. everybody wants to leave the game or leave a business when they're when they're ready to leave. And in sports, it's kind of hard because there's always a young buck coming up stronger, faster, whatever. And, you know, you're going to lose your game and you're going to get out of there. So I, I, I remember that. I uh, actually, Dave, I uh, when I went to the Raiders after the Bengals released me, I went to the Raiders in Los Angeles uh, right before they went back to Oakland. And I went down there and I played linebacker. I didn't really want to play linebacker. I wanted to play safety, but I went to L.A. because that's where I'm from. And then after that season was over with, I uh, talked to my agent. The Raiders didn't want to sign me back. So I decided to retire. And then I got in shape. Marty Schottenheimer goes to Kansas City from Cleveland. Oh, he, goes to, he goes to Kansas City and he calls me, you know, out of the blue. He called me. I don't know if my agent talked to him, but Marty says, hey, I want you to come down and work out for me because I've got a lot of veterans here. Joe Montana was there. Marcus Allen was there. Ronnie Lott was there. All these guys are coming from other teams. And I get down there. Uh, right uh, after the draft and they made all of us run 40 yard dashes. And I'm like, look, dude, I'm 31 years old. I don't want to run a 40. I want to tackle people. They made me run that 40 dude. And let me tell you, worst decision of my life. I got 20 yards into that 40 and I tried to throw some extra oomph in it. And I picked that right leg up, man. And when I picked it up, my quad, it felt like somebody just took a, a knife and stuck it right in the middle of my quad. And I fell right on my face. And when I fell on my face and I, uh, they wind up coming me, come and get me, took me on a cart into the training room and Schottenheimer walked in the training room. I'm telling you, 10 minutes after that, he said, sorry, kid, I'm going to have to send you home. And I'm going, but you made me run a 40. I mean, dude, why you make me run a 40? I mean, I'm used to tackling people. So once again, I do understand when you have injuries, how you can just leave those injuries. But I've got one for you, Bronson. You know, we lost probably – by name, probably one of the best Cincinnati Reds ever played a game at Pete Rose. 
Did you have a relationship with Pete? Did you hear anything from Pete? Did Pete give you some advice to, to help you as a uh, Cincinnati Red ball player? Yeah, I definitely knew Pete over the years. You know, the great thing about playing for the Cincinnati Reds was that a lot of the great eight guys from those 70s teams would come back and hang out. And mm -hmm. you know, I had been on That's the Reds cool. and I had been on the Pirates for many years. And you, you would see a few guys like a Bill Mazeroski, you know, come hang out. Um, you know, or maybe an oil can boy. There was a few Red Sox guys that showed up, but you didn't see a lot of them. And with the Cincinnati team, these guys would come to spring training. They would be floating around the locker room every now and again. And I got to have great conversations with Johnny Bench and with Joe Morgan and, you know, uh, Griffey Sr. and George Foster. All these guys were always around. And Pete was around as well, even though he wasn't allowed in the locker room anymore. You know, he would you'd find him in the Diamond Club having, you know, a bite to eat and I'd sneak in the side door and have a conversation with him or you catch him somewhere in the off season and, and, you know, at an event or whatever, and we'd get to chat it up. I, I don't know if I ever got, I don't know if I got any advice from Pete. He, you know, he was, he was the type of guy who really loved to tell old stories. And so yes. when you're around Pete, you didn't, you didn't necessarily, he was not the type of guy to, to say, Hey, uh, you know, how's your family? But he, he was the type of guy to tell you about every detail of a brand new park opening it up and who was arguing over what. And, <laughs> you know, he got four hits this one night off Nolan Ryan. And he'll tell you that every single at bat and every pitch and what he was thinking. And, uh, you know, he loved to tell old stories. And so it was, it was a joy to be around him, you know, because a lot of times a lot, a lot of that stuff was baseball history. And it's like, you know, having these guys on your wall, you know, as a kid, having a poster of Pete. And the guys on your wall, you know, to, to sit in the flesh with these guys and feel like an equal and, you know, go into the Reds Hall of Fame and stand next to these guys on a stage and, and shake the hand and put the red jacket on and and say, wow, how did I get here? You know, it wow. was it was a thrill for sure. Oh, so great. I bet that was great. Cool. Bronson, there's something similar. Uh, I have another show that I do other than this one. And I had a sheriff come in and I had David on the program at the same time, live in studio. And that sheriff walked in and was basically frozen because since he was that big, he he had a, a David Fulcher uh, picture, a signed picture on his desk, and he has 33 up on his walls, and here he had a chance to meet him. So that's a great, great story about you and Pete and those stories. Let me, we've asked this of other athletes, and I'd love to hear your answer to this. Do you have a most admired teammate that you we can, we can go any of the teams you've played for, but specifically maybe the Reds. Did you have a most admired teammate or a close friend? And is there an opponent that you admired over the years? That could be anybody that uh, comes to mind. Yeah. You know, I think as David would tell you, you, you have at least a handful of guys you played with over your career that you feel a certain kinship with. And part of that could be, you know, not only hanging out maybe at the ballpark or in the weight room, getting workouts together, um, but also maybe in nightlife, right? Like somebody might be your speed. Maybe the, he loves going to the movies with you, or maybe, you know, he loves going to the bar, whatever it is, guys who are kind of like your speed. I think, I think probably David Ross, um, you know, and Ryan Hannigan were the two guys that caught me here in Cincinnati for many years. They just felt like they were my speed. You know, every, they, they love to enjoy themselves, but they never got too reckless. Um, they love music as I love music. You know, those two guys, I would say um, were my, my number two, one guy's probably feeling close knit to, but there were so many guys like Mike Leak and Homer Bailey and, and Joey Votto and Jay Bruce. A lot of these guys, I got to raise them in the game in a way, almost like little brothers and wow. um, show them the ropes and what it was like to be a professional. And so, you know, you still have a kinship with plenty of those guys. Um, Kevin Millar from the Boston Red Sox was somebody who made that locker room go so heavily with his personality that you couldn't help, but just feel drawn to him. And, you know, we're still tight to this day because of that, but, um, guys on the other side, I can't specifically think of one one guy that that I really, um, you know, when you play against guys for a long time, you have this kind of mutual respect and you, and you say what's up in the outfield or you, you say hi during batting practice. But a lot of times you don't get to be in their world enough to really be tight with those guys. I can't think of anybody who didn't play in my own locker room that I felt like a very strong kinship towards. Was somebody um, a tough out for you that you can remember over the course? Was there was there a great player that you had their number and people are like, holy crap, he's got his number? And was there somebody that was a tough out for you? Yeah, the two guys that ring a bell immediately is is uh, Alfonso Soriano was a great right-handed hitter and he just didn't like my breaking ball. And so we'd go head-to-head -head matchups and sometimes he'd be swinging at three curveballs that were, you know, two feet outside and I'd strike him <laughs> out and just make him look like he'd never played the game before. You know, and sometimes you just have guys' numbers like that. But Albert Pujols on the other side, 
I had to face him, you know, 19 games a season and pitch probably against him four times. So he's getting maybe 12 at bats against me in a year. And he was just impossible to get out. He was just a guy who, you know, you don't have many guys in a game who could hit 320, never swing at balls off the plate and also, you know, drive in a hundred and hit 30 or 40 out of the park every, every year, like clockwork. So Albert, he wasn't just your problem. Trust me. He was everybody's problem. problem. Yes. Yeah, everybody's problem. In decade, he was tough out in the game. So I, um, uh, just the simple fact that where did, you know, you, 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 you play music, you, you, you write music. I've heard you sing before, man, and you're unbelievable. And I think our, 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 our hosts, or not our hosts, but our our radio show, Bootleggers Music Group Radio, Paul, he's probably going to want to put some of them songs on his uh, on his radio show. No but here's question. The thing. No question at all. So my question for you, though, is where did that come from? How long were you singing while you were playing? Did you sing when you were a kid, or did it all come after you retired from baseball? No, so I, I grew up in a household where there was a lot of music being played. My grandmother down in Key West, Florida, was a music teacher. And when I was in that house as a kid, I wasn't playing any music, but there was always like a, an orchestra around. So there was people playing the cello, the violin, the piano, and they were always rehearsing in the house. And my father was also played the piano and a little bit of drums and sang a lot. All, you know, when we were driving in the car, he was always singing along and you know, my mother played piano, my sister played piano, and they would sing some harmonies. So it was always around. And I was kind of the black sheep in a way of not really thinking about music. But in the early 90s, when I was 15, 16 years old, you had a lot of the Seattle, you know, sound coming out. And that was, you know, Alice in Chains and Pearl Jam and Nirvana and Soundgarden. And that really grabbed me in high school as an adolescent. And so I started thinking about music a lot more serious than I ever had although I didn't pick up a guitar until I was 22. So wow. now I'm 22. I'm in double A with the Pittsburgh Pirates in a small town called Altoona, Pennsylvania. I've and, been there. And somebody handed me an acoustic guitar and just said, hey, would you like to have this? And I said, sure. And it immediately felt like I wanted to try to, you know, hack my way through a song. And once you have one song that you can play kind of from front to back and you can sing along a little bit, you know, it was very addictive. It felt like a magic trick in a lot of ways that you're creating this sound by yourself. And so it just became this 25 year journey of me, you know, playing around campfires and playing at an open mic night. And it slowly just evolved to making a record and then playing live shows. And now, you know, as you know, David, when you retire from the game, you've been you've been playing at the top of the mountain. It's like a rocket ship for so many years. And when you come down from that, you, you need something to make you a little nervous or, or that's hard to do. And for me, music is not, it doesn't come that easy. I don't have a great ear. I really can't sing harmony, but I've just kind of hacked my way through the years of, of just getting better and better and better in different facets. And now it, it's like a staple of my life. You know, if I didn't have that, I would probably feel like I was eating dessert all the time. And sometimes you just, you need some vegetables, right? You need like something that feels wholesome. I like that. And that's so great. That. I like that. Eat some vegetables. You know, when we were kids now, mom told us to eat them vegetables and we didn't want to eat them when we were kids. And here right. we are over 40 and we love our vegetables. <laughs> right. You know what's so funny about that, Bronson, is and all of us that know David well, all of us that know Faux Rock well, when there's a dessert, like I had a had a really nice birthday dinner with about 10 or 15 of my closest friends and David and Judy were there and uh, David ate like a salad for dinner, a small one, because he saw the cake. And the cake had more flowers than cake, and he wants to. Oh cook yes. With so Jody, uh, Judy sometimes throws vegetables and other things down his throat. Uh, quick question for you: you you've kind of, you've kind of just uh, exchanged one spotlight for the other. You went from being a beloved, and when you know people think of the Reds, you're beloved. I I was there the night that you all that you went into the Hall of Fame with others, and you know uh, George Foster's there being George and. It was a lot of fun to be there that night, but you've exchanged spotlights. You've gone from baseball to music. A couple quick questions. Was was one more is is or was one more fun than the other? Was one tougher or is one tougher than the other? Did one bring you more joy and satisfaction than the other? Between the two spotlights that you've held. Yeah. Give us the breakdown. You know, it's hard. There's there's a in a lot of ways, it's very similar, you know, like getting on stage. Um, especially with a full band, right? And and if you've got, you know, it depends on how many people are watching and how many eyes are on you. But if you've got a nice a nice club and there's five, 600 people in there and you're going to give them a full two-hour show with a full band and really have to give them a performance, 
you know, you get those butterflies in your stomach and you, and you can see all the guys in the band just as on a baseball team or a football team, about 30, 40 minutes before the show starts, right? You start, you see people doing their routines and they're stretching and they're warming up and they're they're getting those butterflies and all, all those nervous ticks we get when we know we're about to go to war, you know, that are fun. It's, it's kind of a little adrenaline. That's very similar. Um, I'd say, you know, it's hard for me to compare music, picking it up at 22, you know, when I was throwing a tennis ball against a wall when I was a six-year-old kid thinking about, you know, pitching in a World Series or making that last out as a shortstop like Ozzy Smith, who was my hero. Right. Um, so, you know, sometimes it's hard to compare the two. And in a lot of ways, baseball, you know, you, you were so focused on helping the team and not trying to embarrass and disappoint yourself that it's it was very rare that you got to totally enjoy the ride until it was over, right? Like, yeah, maybe in the seventh inning, I'm winning five to one and I've got the game under control and you feel like maybe I can take it in now a little bit, but otherwise you're so focused at the task at hand, you don't want it to get, get away that a lot yeah. of times the joy doesn't come till after the fact where musically yeah. I have learned that I can enjoy the performance during the performance. And that makes it, sometimes more joyful than playing playing sports because you really get to you, you're giving something off to the crowd that they're enjoying but I can kind of enjoy that along the ride and look at my bandmates and kind of look over at them and have these moments together where you can smile you know and if there is a mistake you know they're not booing you as, as bad as <laughs> in a stadium when you give up a you know a three-run homer so you know there's a little bit of give and take in both but honestly it it uh it's it's hard to say. If you said Bronson, do you want to be a musician or do you want to be an athlete? I would have definitely taken the baseball first. Wow. I got a question though. Are you a soloist or do you have a band? I thought I heard you mention band. Are you music by yourself or do you have a band that's already in, in, in control? So like you saw me the other night playing with just my acoustic guitar. I'm doing that a little bit more lately for charity events and stuff um, because I've written a bunch of songs lately that I'm enjoying playing for people. But the kind of meat and potatoes of what I've been doing for the last 10 years is a full band here in Cincinnati. We travel, you know, about an hour and a half outside of the city and anywhere in between. And, uh, you know, we usually play about 15, 20 times a year. That's called the Bronson Royal Band. And that that's all cover songs. So it's pretty much, you know, it's the Beatles, it's Tom Petty, it's Nirvana, it's R.E.M., it's Pearl Jam, it's Stone Temple Pilots. We give, you know, about two, two hours, wow. sometimes a two and a half hour show with a full band. And that's fun because I'm the worst player in the band, right? And if <laughs> if, I'm, if I'm the worst guy in the band, then hopefully we sound decent. And it's also something to kind of strive towards, which is like, you know, keeping up with your bandmates that are that have been playing since they're little kids. Wow. Bronson, wow. quick question. You said you picked it up at 22. The founder of the station, this is Bootleggers Music Group Radio. His name's Paul Jones. I think he plays between eight and 10 instruments on a weekly basis daily now. He goes down by the stadium and plays his sax and does music for homeless and and tries to raise money. He I he wrote an aria. He sends me he sends me a symphony. I want to listen to my symphony. He's never taken a music lesson. He mm. plays eight to ten instruments. He's just a genius. He's a savant. He he developed this whole station. What about you? Did somebody when somebody handed you that acoustic guitar at twenty two, did you seek out a way to learn it or did you pick it up and start playing? You know, I just, I learned on my own, but I did, I did ask questions. You know, I, I would run into people on the street. We were traveling, let's say we're playing in Toronto against the Blue Jays. You run into a, a semi-homeless guy playing his guitar on the corner for some change. And, and you ask him to play you a couple of songs, right? You give him a couple bucks and maybe he plays me a, a Pink Floyd song and you're watching his fingers and his hands and, and you're asking him how he learned it. Maybe and you have these conversations with people and you, you start having these little light bulbs go off over time. And so I paired that with looking up tablature, which is kind of a number system to tell you what chords to play in songs. And so I can't read sheet music, but I could learn tablature and just see the chords, know the melody of a song in my head and kind of like hack your way through it. And then over time, you get to better and better to where you could figure them out by ear. And then, you you know, you have kind of all the chords in your repertoire and you can kind of like figure most songs out. So it was a very, very slow process. It probably took me two years to be able to feel like I could play songs all the way from front to back that I could present to somebody that you would kind of recognize what I was doing. But, you know, over time, you just, you peel back the layers of your craft, you know, because standing up is totally different than playing sit it down. S having to stay on a microphone versus not having a microphone is totally different because now you can't look down at your fingers. So there's, wow. there's all these layers that are happening 
in the music that I've had to get used to over a long period of time. And then, you know, then you slam on there, like you're playing with a full band now and you can't just stand there all night, like George Strait, if you're playing some Pearl Jam. So it's like, how much can you jump around on the stage and still have some breath to hit those notes in even flow, right? Like, so mm -hmm. there's all these things that you're trying to work out. And that, that's why I love it because it's difficult and it, and it's gets, it never gets easy. You know, it's always something that I go out there to try to strive and be excellent in that, but you always seem to find you, you fall a little short. Wow. You know, we, we asked our guests, dude, that, I'm telling you, you're a, a great answer, Ben. <laughs> you, you're a man with many talents, man. And I, I appreciate you big time, but we, we, we normally talk to our guests and ask them, um, you know, their faith, their belief in Christ um, was when you were young, was Christ in your life. And then obviously as you got older, was your faith important or is it still important? Can you, can you get, elaborate on that a little bit with us? Yeah, I'm probably I'm probably going to be a bad one to ask the question to. I um I grew up in a household. My father was Cuban, my mother was from the Keys. Um and so there was always a little bit of Catholicism, you know, on on the obviously on the Spanish side of the family because that's where um you know, most of people who are coming from Spain or from Cuba or Venezuela, you know, it kind of lands in their lap. But I had a father who was a little bit of an outside thinker. It was partially it was partially why I pitched the way I pitched, right? Because I got in the weight room with him at a young age and he was always thinking outside the box a little bit. And that it, part of that was the strategy that I used. You know, when you're when you're eight years old and you squat 250 pounds and you weigh 60 pounds, if you're going to try to do 260 over the next six months, just 10 pounds or five pounds extra, all these small details matter, right? How, how tight are your clothes? What food are you eating? Are you resting at night? And so a lot of that strategy was built in me from those early days being in the weight room with my father. But he also was, yeah. like I said, kind of an outside the box thinker. And, you know, his philosophy on life when it came to that was kind of his own little brand of things. And he made me think outside that box as well. And for me, it's always been about kind of present tense and how, how, you, how you bring joy to the people around you and, and how much can you bring a smile to somebody's face, right? And just just right. somebody leave your presence and say, I enjoyed being with that guy and I'll hang out again. Yeah. And that that for me was where all the magic was. And you know, in some of the songs that I sang the other night that you saw, there was a few lines in there where I said in the first song called Lucky Pennies, you know, I said, I, I don't pray. And um, for me, for me, it was just wishful thinking. You know, for me, I wanted to, I wanted to do what I could do. I'm here to help you. I hope I do my job. And then I go about my business and help somebody else. I was never oh, looking yeah. to the rest of the universe to do anything for me. I wanted to do it myself. And uh, so for me, I, I, where we go, where we go when it's all said and done in that same song, it says, I don't really care. Yeah. I, don't, I just hope that the people who I've touched in any facet at all, whether it's at the checkout line at the grocery store, or if it was old teammates, I hope that everything I've ever laid down was pure positivity and that when I left their presence, they said, that was a good guy. Nothing wrong with that, man. Nothing wrong with that at all. Yes. So great. Just this show alone, Bronson, all 50 states, 130 uh, foreign countries and our member, our viewership and listenership's growing every month. And you just changed. I had no idea. I knew how much fun we were going to have to have yeah. you on the show. I didn't know you were this deep. And I have, I have to tell you, you know, you, you, we've all been down to the stadium and you were there as a player. I'm sure you've gone back and watched some games here and there. You walk out there, there are different homeless people in different corners and you have a couple people who will walk by and maybe put a dollar to and most try to ignore them. Most might throw some money in. What do you do? You say, play me a couple songs. Here's a couple bucks. Play me a couple songs. Let me learn a little bit more about my craft. Yeah. See, that's pretty cool because instead yes. of just throwing money in a cup, that person had a purpose and then and a connection with you for a couple of minutes where they felt like they were actually teaching you something. And I, I just want to say this, I'm not going to say too much because I think he'll get mad, but you, you need to get in touch. We're going to put you in touch with Paul, the owner of the station, because he's currently working on a music endeavor. I'll just say that, that involves oh, yeah. the homeless. <clears throat> so oh, yeah. he's going to probably want to be in touch with you, have all of your music on the station. Oh yeah. Probably have you involved in that project. Well, thanks, man. I appreciate it. Yeah. You know, it's, it's been, it's been fun to, you know, I, I always, I, you get these little moments in life where you, where you find, you know, the most joy. And, and a lot of times for me, it's always been about, cause the same way that I pitched, right. The way that you pitch is you're guesstimating what you think the guy's looking for and you're trying to do something different, mm -hmm. but in, in regular life, it's been very fun to try to guesstimate what somebody wants or needs and try to give it to them before they ask you. 
So, you know, there'll be these small moments where you, you, you analyze someone's body language or what's going on. And that, you know, that's even like if you're at a festival or something and you see a situation and it's like, is this person having a good time or do I need to go intervene because something is off here, right? Just, just kind of being aware of your surroundings and trying to make sure that the people around you are safe and secure and feel that way has always meant a lot to me. And so whether you're having a conversation with a bum who's playing a guitar on the street, or if you're talking to a college kid at a bar, you know, I've always given people the time of day. And, and um, I saw a lot of my teammates not do that early on when they were, you know, they were too, too good to hang out at a bar and talk oh, to yeah. a college oh, kid, yeah. right? You how see did that, that make you feel? Can I stop? Yeah. That, how did that, I know how it makes David Fulcher feel because we are brothers from another mother and we're very similar human beings. How did it make you feel over the years to watch your teammates, various cities, you played in a couple, right. who just would basically ignore others or not give people the time of day? Yeah, I mean, for me, they were just robbing themselves of what you yeah. could get, right? Because it just really is no better feeling than being able to kind of give, right? Like people say all the time, like, what do you think about Bronson? Well, a lot of times when I say yes to doing anything, whether it's this podcast or playing a show for somebody, most of the time it's for somebody else. But in return, the joy that I get is kind of like the icing on top of the cake, right? If I, if I play a show in town, it's never about the money, even though the band's making a little bit of money, but it's, you know, there's two guys in my band who play music for a living. So I, I feel indebted to make sure that they work enough. Right. And I get the joy of people coming up to me after the show saying, Hey, I never saw the band before, but man, you guys were great. And you, and you made it a good night for us. Right. And awesome. those things have always meant so much and felt so good that when I watched teammates who blew people off, I felt like they were robbing themselves of an experience that they could have with, with quote unquote, normal people um, you know, in everyday life. And I just never quite understood it because um, even when I was a little kid, my mother, you know, we were, we would be down in the keys and my mother would maybe play tennis, let's say in an afternoon. And I'd be at the park in Key West. And if I was tired of throwing a tennis ball against the wall, I usually would somehow migrate. This is at seven and eight years old. I'd migrate to a bent park bench where you're talking to a 75 year old. And in those conversations, I always got buzzed in a joy out of asking questions and tell me about your life. And I coached this conversation out of this person that almost made me feel like I was high, like I was buzzed sure. um, just by hearing their life experiences. And I knew that when I left there, even though I was a little kid, they felt that kind of joy too. And that that feeling had never left me. And I, I'm always trying to create that. You know, it's funny, not 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 ha ha funny, but when you say that, I go, God, it sounds just like me. You know, my my passion for playing football was a gift from God. He gave me a gift to do what I do. God gave you a gift. Not only did he give you a gift to, to pitch the ball, but he also gave you a gift to say, you know, I'm I'm no different from you. This is why I do what I do. I, I come to the park bench. I play my music. I walk up and I see a homeless guy playing a drum or playing something, a guitar, and I put money in the in the in his cup. And putting the money in the cup is just a, a celebration of him singing to everybody that walks by. But to stand there and go, hey, how do you do that? Can you show me how you flip that finger? How you do this? I tried to play a guitar in my in my life. It didn't work. But I used to play a saxophone when I was a kid. Dave, you don't even know that. When I was in junior high school, no. No. I played I played a, a, an alto saxophone. Oh, and let me tell you oh. something. I used to listen to people who played the sax. And when they played the sax, I used to love how the music came out of that instrument. And I picked them up. And when I picked them up, I said, you know what? I'm going to learn. But then when I got, after I got out of high school, I said, I'm, I, I'm an athlete. I'm going to put all my money into my sports game, not into my playing a, an instrument game. But dude, you're, you're, you're a blessing. And I, and I'm saying this truth. Um, I hear, I hear you say, and I asked you a question about your faith, and you, 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 it came out of your mouth. You didn't, you didn't say, my faith has moved me, but your conversation that came out of your mouth, faith has been always in your life. The man upstairs has always been in your life, and you are a, you're, and we had, I had a, a player on, uh, on our on our show, Doug Williams, quarterback from the Redskins, and won the Super Bowl back in 1988, 87. And I was just talking to him and the guy has a gift. He, he was so talented. He was so talented. You got a gift, dude. And I heard you sing the other night. And I'm telling you, coming from Los Angeles, a lot of these, uh, the, 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 
songwriters that you just mentioned, the Led Zeppelins and the and the REO speed wagons. I have no idea who that is. The speed wagon to me is somebody riding down the street David, with a speed David. wagon. Holy so crap. I know, man. Ron, so we got to help this guy out. We got to play. I know, man. I'm, I'm, we got, we got I'm to come over to the studio and let Bronson knock out a few for you. I know, man. So I would tell you this, man, just listen to you talk. You are a giver, not a taker. Yeah. And I know a lot of people in the world, we talk about athletes, athletes who don't want to do, they don't want to do. The athletes today make so much money, they, they can't shake somebody's hand, they can't take a picture unless they get paid for it. And I'm thinking, you're making a hundred million dollars a year, you should be able to sign all the autographs in the world, take the picture with these kids because right. those are the ones who pay our salaries. You know, right. they, when they come to a Reds game, they come to a Bengals game, they buy a ticket. Well, when I get my paycheck on Monday, those people just put money into my paycheck. So why not give back to them? And you've doing that and continue to keep doing it, brother. Yeah, thanks. It's been, it's been, you know, I mean, honestly, you could, you could play the game and you're going to have, you're going to have some joy playing the sport that you've tried to craft over your entire life. But all those outside things, I mean, now I go down to the Reds locker room, you know, I'm welcomed in that place by the, by the guys who've been working down there for the last 30 or 40 years with open arms, right? And sometimes guys are not welcomed in that way because of the how they treated them while they played yes. the game, or maybe they didn't understand that maybe tipping a little bit more was the way to go, you know, and people were a little mm -hmm. stingy, whatever it is. I've just, I've really enjoyed being around people and having them leave my presence and say, hey, I'll go back and hang out with that guy anytime. And and that that has always been a driving force. And, you know, it's never going to go away. It's kind of built into the machine. But, you know, so if people don't want to do that, then I just think they're robbing themselves a lot of times of that joy that you're going to get. Cause it's, it's very, you know, you can, as you know, David, when you have a decent amount of money, you could go and buy all the cars you want after a few days. It's just a car. It but, is just a car. Yes. But when you, but when you, when you make a meal for somebody, right. Or you, you, yeah. you do something that's interconnected with, with a human being, uh, you know, whether it's around the golf or helping them, you know, pack their house up and move somewhere, whatever that is that stuff really sticks sometimes and, and, and it's, it's a lot different than an inanimate object. Yes. Ross, I have a quick comment, then one more question, and David, I'll turn yes. it over to you to kind of come to a close with us here. Ron, so you might've said, I don't pray, wasn't brought up in that type of family, but let me tell you, and I know this is exactly what David was just thinking. Yes. There's a lot of people that we all know that claim to be Christian and you can go through a litany of spiritual and religious connections whose words and actions don't follow that up in any form or fashion. Yes. You might say, I don't pray. I wasn't brought up in a family that did that kind of stuff, but you're living every day oh, in yeah. a way that is an absolute message for other people on the best way to live life. And my, my last question for you, and then David, you can ask whatever you want. Uh, you have a gift. Okay. Obviously you have a musical gift. <clears throat> you had a great baseball gift. I'm a professional public speaker. Just having you on this show today, you're better than 95% of the other speakers I've ever been in contact with in what I do for a living. Have you ever thought about adding that to your repertoire? Do you already do it? If you want to do it more, I'd be happy to help you. Have you done Have you done um, a TED Talk yet? Have you thought about that? If you want to head that direction in life and you're not already doing it, count me in. Yes. Well, thanks, man. I appreciate it. You know, I when I do podcasts, a lot of times, you know, you don't pay attention sometimes in a locker room about what other guys are saying to the media, but you do find yourself, you know, standing at your locker and, and answering questions more often than other guys over the years. And, you know, I generally give people a non sugar coated answer, um, try to give you the truth and try to, you know, own up to whatever it is that was your part in some downfall and try to take responsibility for that. So, you know, over the years, you'd hear things like that. And I go on people's podcasts and they'll say like, hey, you sure you don't want to have your own? Um, you know, so I've gotten it over the years. I do speak out, you know, not all of the time, you know, I, I feel like my time is still somewhat limited because I, I try to do so many things, you know, you're only one person and I try to do the charity thing and I'm playing music and you're trying to play golf and you're trying to hang with your wife a little bit. So it's, it's tough sometimes, but I definitely get to high schools, get to, um, go to hospitals and, you know, and I get to talk to kids a lot of times at elementary schools and stuff. And it's, it's definitely a joy to do that. I think, Sometimes when you're thinking, I haven't done a TED Talk and, you know, I feel like a TED Talk needs to be about a very specific kind of subject in a way. And I feel like I'm a mixed bag in a way. Like I, I can tell some stories about how I got to the big leagues and how I survived for 20 years being a, a non-hard thrower. You know, those years in the weight room as a young kid, 
were very unusual. And I can talk about how that kind of parlayed into this Bronson, career. Actions speak louder than words is your podcast. I would be happy to meet soon, have lunch. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, we'll yeah. come into the studio so David can hear what REO Speedwagon sounds like. Yeah. Hard to have mercy that, on the soul. But that hurts, but man. It could be that something hurts, as man. simple. <laughs> REO Speedwagon. When I hear REO, I'm like, what's a REO Speedwagon? <laughs> but I'm sorry. I'm I'm just, you know. He's trying to get on what he's going to hit next. How do oh, I yeah. get someone from REO? Yeah. But yeah. You, you, could, you know, David, who Bootsy Collins is, we're good. <laughs> oh, I know Bootsy Collins. Yes, I know Bootsy Collins. That's easy. <laughs> I'd be happy to help you, Bronson. I, I think you could do one. And I think the, a simple title is Actions Speak Louder Than Words. And You've got multiple things going through your life that you can cover. But yes. honestly, the story of tipping someone begging for money on the street who then performs a service to you by playing music and you learn from that, what better message can we send to the world than don't ignore people you think aren't worth your time? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's great. That's unbelievable. But Ronson, I got one more, man. Baseball has changed. We know that. You're a pitcher. And they're telling you, you only got 15, 16 seconds between pitches. Are you a fan of that or are you okay with it? You know, I was a guy who pitched relatively quick as it was. I, I like to keep the game rolling. The only time I was going to pull back and slow the game down was when you're getting your butt kicked a little bit. You know, you're, you're in trouble early in the game. It's second and third. It's hot out. You, you know, you're trying to slow the game down, change some momentum. But I, I really love pitching quick, so I wouldn't have mind – the, the clock at all. And I think over watching the last couple of seasons, you know, it feels like you want a baseball game to be played out to its fullest, right? Like I remember Derek Jeter saying something like, what's the difference between a two hour and 45 minute game and a three hour and 15 minute game? You know, as long as you, you, you got to take the game serious, every at bat counts and you've got to, you know, try to get the job done. But I will say shaving a half an hour off the games has been, it's been fun to watch. It's been it's been good, I think, for the game. It it does keep the pace going a little bit. And I don't think it's hurting the guys that much. There might be a handful of guys that are really bothered by it, but otherwise, I think it's been pretty reasonable. And a lot of the rule changes that I thought were a little too quirky, you know, like taking away the shift and you know, speeding up the clock and making the bases larger, all these things, they they've turned out to be pretty good. And I think um baseball is moving in a pretty good direction. Even the even the uh, the instant replay has been something that I've, I've really enjoyed. You don't have the managers fighting out on the field as much because you're seeing the instant replay and they can change it. So um, I would I would have enjoyed that, keep the pace of the game going. It's nothing better than than pitching a big league baseball game, winning, and then having a chance to still get a dinner before the restaurant closes because uh, <laughs> yes. hours and 20 minutes. That's a good one. Thank you, man. I that appreciate that. You've been a great guest. Uh, yes, David yes. Well, I tell you what, man, I, I we are, you know, you're, you're, you're the star of the show, man. We just, we're, well, I'm on a platform that gives me an opportunity to talk to people, give, give some kind of instruction to young kids. Cause there's going to be a young man that's listening to this uh, mom and dad, or, you know, my mom, I want to play football. Mom, I want to play baseball. What would you say to a, a five-year-old young man right now? Who's thinking about playing the game of baseball? What would you give advice you would give him uh, to take care of that business? I think the best kind of well-rounded advice would come from, you see so many people who beat themselves up mentally for having failures during a game. And I, I think I would say the simplest thing that can stretch all the way to a big leaguer is prepare yourself the way you're supposed to, which means you get to sleep on time, you, you, you eat the food you're supposed to eat, you get all your workouts in, you never miss a practice. You're always punctual on that you know, be, be kind of hard on yourself to not miss those types of things. And then when you play the game against other guys that are trying to kick your butt, just enjoy the ride. And if, if you have failures out on the field, you've got to wipe it off the shoulder quick and get back to the drawing board of doing things, you know, that make you a, a quality player. I've seen so many guys be the opposite where they miss a couple of things in their, in their training. And then they're really harsh on themselves for losing on the field, you know, they're disgusted with themselves for days on end. They're negative. And I, I would just say, try to keep the positivity. Think of the games that you play as like a live show. You don't know what's going to happen. Let's just see what happens. You're going to win some, you're going to lose some, but we're not going to let it drag us down into the next couple of days. We're going to get back to the drawing board, enjoy the workouts, and then boom, try to play another game. And I think if you do that, you give yourself the best opportunity to be the best player you can without kind of beating yourself up um, mentally. 
Awesome I, stuff. I know man. that man so well. You just motivate him. He's going to get up from this. He's going to go out, walk the dogs, look at his jerseys, see if they still fit. Dave, David, are you ready to take the field? I'm ready to give that one last hit in me, man. <laughs> one last hit, brother. You know that. Bronson, thank you, man. I really appreciate your time. And uh, man, what a what a what another great show. And uh as really? soon as uh Paul gets this thing up and running, we'll send it to you, man. We'll let you know. Appreciate you again, brother. Ron, thank, thank you guys. so much. Uh, you're gonna hear back, you're gonna hear from us, you're gonna hear from me. And I, I think Paul's gonna want to meet you. He's gonna go oh, yeah. get your music on the station. And oh, I think yeah. he's gonna want to talk to you about the homeless project. I would like to talk to you more about being a speaker. And we'll get David out to your studio so he can learn music he's never heard. So That's on behalf it. of David Fulcher and the amazing Bronson Arroyo, uh, what a great guest. This is David Coleman. You've been listening to Overtime Life After the Spotlight. We're here on Bootleggers Music Group Radio. Please take a moment and visit our site. Please download the Bootleggers Music Group app. Share this program with others because I don't think there's a life that Bronson didn't touch that could be made better by what he said today. Thanks yes, for listening. Sir. We'll see you next time. You've been listening to Overtime with NFL All-Pro David Fulcher and co-host, award-winning speaker David Coleman on the Bootleggers Music Group Radio. Be sure to catch all our shows and music by downloading our app at bootleggersmusicgroup.com. All content is published and owned by the Bootleggers Music Group LLC and Zasco Publishing and may not be duplicated without prior written consent. Executive producer, Paul E. Jones. Paul E. Jones.